Thank you, Jane, and thank you, John. Um, I was lucky. I I was lucky to be here in one of the last um, incarnations of this conference when we were just starting out as an office. Um, so we didn't have a lot to show at that time. We'd have a little bit more to show at this time, but it'll all be work in progress. So we're five years in, and this kind of experiment as a new um, office that's focused on the public realm of cities. And um, so I, I just thought I would talk a little bit about that work in progress, about thinking about landscape, particularly or specifically in Toronto, a city under enormous um, pressure right now. So it's not so much that we're landscaping under pressure, but it's kind of like uh, kind of uh, exciting energy around thinking about landscaping um, in a very uh, pressured environment. Um, just to, because... I'll just share, this is sort of where we work, this is our table, we sit around one table, and for that, for us, it's really important to be sort of small and, and close, um, and our, our crew of 14 um, really bright, brilliant people are from all kinds of backgrounds, so from landscape architecture, from urban design, from architecture, uh, from civil engineering, but we kind of all not only share a table, but kind of share, I think, a sensibility about um, or focus on the public realm as a really kind of, as Jane maybe said, as a kind of new topic, let's say, uh, of awareness right now, particularly in Toronto at this moment of growth. And I guess another sort of thing we share in some ways, it's harder to define, but a certain sensibility about landscape and the potential kind of role of landscape in, in the city. and. Uh, and this kind of underlying um, desire to sort of think about as we conceptualize, reconceptualize our city, that there's a sort of um, really important underlying role for, for landscape in the broadest sense of the word. Um, you know, the whole frame of, the, of today's discussion is really sort of about this very shocking image that maybe many of you have seen at different times, but I, it ceases to amaze me this sort of um, our city or Toronto just sort of oscillating between the city kind of we maybe knew if you're on the Gardner 10 years ago and then the sort of city you're seeing today and of course that will continue to grow and we know that there's projected growth for the city to double its size in the core in terms of population. And that um, context, that's that kind of pressure of growth, of densification has been really a, a kind of exciting time for an office that's thinking about the public realm. Um, and this sort of, it spawned a kind of, um, let's say, kinds of projects that work at different scales in terms of how housing can kind of be rethought in those, in, a, in, a, in the, one of the densest neighborhoods in, in the city in King West, um, how private new development proposals can actually start to take on existing public realm elements, like some of our more historic parks or squares, and actually re-equip them for um, a city of increasing residential population um, and how they kind of can add to their kind of performance in terms of their amenities and how the public realm can kind of handle different needs, how institutions can start to actually take fragments of very small landscapes but allow them to perform perhaps differently in terms of um, their, you know, the university populations as well as the, the communities they sit in. Um, and, and we've been able to work also with the city in terms of thinking with them about their guidelines for understanding growth and the balance between the public realm and how guidelines can start to think differently about how the sense of balance can be regained, not necessarily always through new parks per se, but actually through new forms of public space that may actually involve rethinking other existing elements of the public realm like streets and having them work a lot harder and in different ways. And we also are even seeing in this context developers who are, um, you know, like in this case, um, two towers by Wilkinson Air that are actually bridged by uh, an elevated sky park over the rail yard. So in fact, creating new public spaces um, out of thin air, so to speak, as a kind of, um, in a way, antidote for, um, for this kind of increased density. And Michael already showed this, this image but of, of a kind of a moment that where things maybe can happen in the public realm that we, yeah, we would never have expected, where this intensity has created kind of values that are out of, 
uh, in the, of land that are um, so outrageous, but also lend themselves to a different way of constructing public public spaces, um, like Rail Deck Park, where you know perhaps through a kind of concerted effort, a 21-acre park could be born uh, in a place that we would have never imagined. And at the sort of largest scale, we're also looking to new territories of the city, like the Portlands, and thinking about how um, growth will um, later occur and what forms it will take as the city does grow into its um, post-industrial landscapes. So I, I, I wanted to kind of return to this image, and this image particularly, because um, more than anything, it's a chance to sort of um, look at the balance of our city, um, and that, that word balance comes up a lot in terms of the, the sense, especially that the public spaces of our city are kind of being eclipsed by the growth. Um, but it, you know, in terms of an office thinking about landscape, there's almost um, a chance in this moment to also think about how landscape and the structure and form of the city actually could all be reconceptualized. And so that in this moment that where we've sort of been, come from a city that's always been reaching vertically to the sky for its identity, for its sort of form. Um, and this is the city sort of I know as a, you know, from my hometown growing up in the city, always just like wanting to be this city of great towers. Um, now that we've arrived at that moment or someone, now that we're there, the question is sort of what next? And um, for us, it's very interesting to start to think about how the city, this, this amazing kind of accumulation of a built form starts to become anchored to the ground and to the place. And it's sort of less about um, the end point of being sort of the more built form, but actually now that we have this form, how can we start to um, use this as a starting point for kind of next, next series of efforts over the next, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years, where we start to build in the sort of the next level, sort of layers of public realm that can support this. And of course, take all uh, Michael's advice about densifying on a mid-rise level you know, with those incredible recipe of six numbers. It, it's amazing that if you've been in a helicopter lately, and, you get these kind of views. And uh, we did this a couple of times during the last year, and it's, I should have just brought like 300 of the images because the gaze as you move from this gaze to this gaze is sort of really surprising. It's something that I think we all kind of know in our heads that there, are, there exist these two Torontos, but there's something about sort of hovering and kind of you know, toggling between them that, that really, um, points to sort of, um, I think in a way, more the, the foundational landscape of our city that we have somehow thought less about in our spirit of sort of becoming this great world city of, that reaches for the sky. And um, somehow this metropolitan structure of a landscape which we inherited um, and has been very much eroded in some cases but still exists in a profound way. The ravines, um, the river valleys, some of the former creek corridors, and of course the waterfront, which all encompass sort of, let's say, our larger landscape. I think um, now is a really exciting moment to think about that, the city and how it nests itself and lands sort of in, in its landscape. Um, we have made great steps and, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible because somehow the first step of this exercise has been led by Waterfront Toronto's efforts on the direct sort of front line of our city on the lake. And um, those efforts, um, which actually, you know, Jane mentioned the sort of founding of our office sort of through this process, that's Adam and I sitting on the, kind of contemplating this, um, this curve and whether we'd make a complete mistake or not. Um, uh, but somehow this, uh, this process of, um, you know, recolonizing that front edge of our city as a sort of primary waterfront and how that started to move back with the opening of Queen's Key to sort of open up the second line of the waterfront, the direct edge and the sort of secondary edge, speaks to sort of, I think, um, the task that we feel like our generation kind of can now take forward in terms of um, the public space design. That sort of, like the city of sort of, 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 the, of the core of great density, great vitality, 
um, what, what happens next, or how do we then sort of fine tune what we have? And similarly, the efforts of Waterfront Toronto in staking out a whole new conception of landscape, public space design, um, public realm on the lakefront, how do those then move deeper into the city? How do we take those sort of what we've learned, the conversation that's been started, and extend that um, far deeper into the city so it per permeates, let's say, all, all aspects of our everyday life? And so somehow, I think, you know, I, I would like to dedicate at least 50 years to sort of thinking about this sort of next section of blue, lighter blue, um, and, and, um, and what that could mean in terms of um, starting to uh, refine our urban connections to, uh, to the landscape. And so this is, uh, this is that model which sits in our office, which sort of reminds us that Toronto sort of is a city carved by a glacial retreat. Um, that its greatest assets, of course, in addition to its lakefront, are also its river valleys. Thanks, Jane. Um, and so I, th I thought I just, I'm not, I'll, I just thought I'd show a few projects, five, maybe, very quickly, um, that um, that deal with this uh, sort of Toronto condition um, of, uh, of you know a city under pressure and a kind of landscape response, but um, but that. That have a kind of sense of share a sensibility. Perhaps it's about this sort of um, not starting from scratch, but either building upon and sort of looking for the latent and sort of sort of let's say hidden but 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 uh, present qualities and how to bring those uh, further to life. So the first, I want to talk. One I want to talk about is a park that we began. It was our first project in the office, um, and it's um, the former mouth of Garrison Creek. And uh, this is um, kind of like a, a project about time travel in some ways and expresses this sort of, on one hand, this, this sort of, you know, the growing community of City Place um, and the historic Fort York and National Historic Site. And a landscape that was once there, this promontory, which opened out into the lake and then a kind of landscape currently there where there's no no such uh, hint of that uh, formal landscape whatsoever. And uh, also a site that's a, frankly very tough urban condition, sort of strangled by, um, you know, on one hand, a kind of paradise of a, uh, like an artifact of the uh, military era of our city, and then on the other hand, um, sort of every sign of, of infrastructure, rail, uh, viaduct, um, urban development, on, and then a pretty great library by KPMB architects. Um, but it's a project really about uh, restoring a kind of lost connection. This is Garrison Creek as we find it, if you can find it. Uh, there's also other great like hints of where that river ran. And if you go on Shaw and there's houses that are tipping over, you can kind of spot these things. But you know, it was a creek that ran all the way up to Christie, Christie Pits. Um, uh, and like many of our kind of lost water courses, this was the old form uh, of, of that, uh, those watersheds. And, this is sort of how it stands today. Garrison Creek is probably one of the most like renowned of those lost creeks. Um, so it's sort of it's really nice that it it stands to kind of be regenerated here. Um, this is this is the site, and we're proposing sort of a very um, bold re reconstruction of um, actually the artifact of the promontory. That's that's really born out of these uh, anecdotal diary entries by Elizabeth Simcoe and these amazing watercolors that describe that bluff and the kind of, kind of <coughs> immense kind of form of it, which we try to connect actually to some ancient but also rarely used today techniques of, of, uh, of constructing landscapes, like from rammed earth to cast concrete and others that could showcase actually this kind of rough, really um, vibrant kind of texture of what that bluff would, might have felt like. Um, as well, sort of thinking about the kind of native landscapes that would have originally been in that situation. We've kind of, we made a proposal that would actually exaggerate the already very um, strong kind of bench, of, sort of there's a, a four and a half meter separation from high ground to low ground, but actually intensify that, that shift even more because um, the park was sort of at risk of just being a hole, hole in the ground, surrounded by everything else. So by lifting up this new promontory, we actually create three really distinct uh, zones. 
um, of which we can mediate the kind of connection between them by this, uh, this ramp. Um, and so what we are able to create is a lowlands where we can actually daylight a portion of that creek and allow a kind of lowland ecology to emerge that actually would be a little bit more reminiscent of that original environment. And then start to create the bluff itself and then a high ground um, that would give you a vantage point for the first time over Bathurst itself and actually to the fort. So you could connect actually the fortification with this, it's sort of, it's reason of being there on the shoreline next to this promontory um, and, and offer a panorama of, uh, of the city sort of in most postmodern city. So some views of, of what that access could look like and how that could link to a new network of trails which are now coming to life through through the pedestrian bridges and efforts that the city is doing in sort of <coughs> reconnecting its cycling routes. Um, moving on to the, to, it's very, very, about 300 meters away to um, Fort York Pedestrian Bridge. This is a strange sort of project that we somehow became involved in after a quite popular design was already proposed um, by Montgomery Sison, um, architect. Uh, and I think everyone in the city wished was built, um, but due to budget constraints, it was over. We had a mayor leadership at the time that kind of nixed the project. We became involved in a um, and, and shortlisted uh, in an exercise that was about um, basically uh, a design build project that was trying to create this bridge for basically half the budget. And so um, our interest in and you know in getting involved with would, was to do something actually kind of entirely different um, and to actually think about less the the crossing, but more how this infrastructure, this public infrastructure could um, sharpen our understanding of the founding landscape of the city and this kind of overlay and, uh, of, of many traces that even more so than other parts of the city where you can sort of understand and see um, the kind of geological landscapes, the military history, the kind of industrial transformation of the city through rail and then um, the city as it grows out as a kind of residential district. So um, rather than um, rather than sort of focusing on the crossings per se, we had this uh, idea of thinking about the landings. So le to actually put the least effort into the spans and the most efforts into how these bridges could be anchored into the communities or the, the park spaces. So we developed a proposal that was really, rather than um, 250 meter spans, we sort of looked at this 500 meter plus cross section, sorry. Um, and you know what that was really about was a sort of sequence of spaces that would take you from um, communities in the north, from Trinity Bellwoods Park, and deliver you all the way down to the waterfront. So we had sort of a bridge design that was as sort of simple as it could possibly be, um, and uh, was drawn from this idea of sort of the two predominant bridges that existed in this kind of heritage landscape, or bracketed this heritage landscape, which were um, the Bathurst Street Bridge and then the Strawn uh, Girder Bridge. So there was a truss bridge and a girder bridge. And we just thought, well, let's marry those two, produce a child, um, and it would be a kind of truss girder. Um, and we'd give it a little bit of a, like a little bit of a dance. Um, and strangely, that I could not find an example of that existing. Like, sort of, there's like thousands and thousands of truss bridges and girder bridges, and no one had ever sort of married them, probably for good reason, but... Um, what was fascinating about this sort of marriage is that it offered um, uh, us to sort of a very simple construction um, uh, and, and fabrication and installment, but also that kind of could showcase then um, uh, these, the open side would really predominantly open views, one back to the city, uh, the other sort of the, the eastern and western views that we could kind of start to focus those kind of view sheds a little bit. But, Again, the, the most important was actually how those landed and how those landed according to the very different context of the north side and the south side uh, of the project. But one actually was referring more to what was, as we knew, um, uh, the path of Garrison Creek. And the south was really about how um, you landed in the National Historic Site and the Commons. 
So, so building on some thinking about the creek landing, we actually proposed that the project would deliver more than just a base park condition um, and a cycle path up and over the bridge, but actually start to build some of the park infrastructure. Um, so that your approach or your feeling of the crossing sort of began at Wellington Street, but actually would take you up and, and form this um, kind of uh, structure, uh, canopy structure, pergola landing that would offer this kind of incredible view back over the city. Um, it would take you across to Fort York and, and give you this balcony over the, the commons, which was um, which is the way actually the uh, which is the way the um, militia. Uh, the way they encountered the battle was sort of through the forest. Um, the next project I want to talk about is, is this, is this working? Sorry. How's this? Pretty good. Yeah. Um, we feel um, really excited and, and, and and fortunate to be able to think about a project that's really not a traditional uh, public realm. It's, it's really thinking about this often discussed um, piece of infrastructure. And this is really an exciting moment you know, in the city where we can actually have conversations about uh, public space appearing in, in these sort of stranger places. And they're not that strange because, you know, really we've been seeing them all around the world. Um, um, in places where actually the pressure is higher than it is in Toronto. Now in Toronto we're starting to see actually a degree of pressure that allows us to open up these kinds of spaces. But looking at the uh, old Gardner uh, structure is sort of unbelievable. What you inherit is remarkable. You know, it's, if you, you just have to go there once and you sort of, you feel the monumentality of it, um, the clarity of it. And so our, our efforts are really about um, Doing as little as possible and allowing, um, uh, you know, uh, allowing our, uh, the sort of uh, unique context to sort of drive actually the activities, um, and to think actually a bit more as a choreogra choreography of programming, animation, activation. And so we've been working, um, we're, you know, we're working with Artscape, who has been incubating a conservancy that will actually operate and run and program this site on an ongoing basis. And it's been guided kind of by thinking about it's sort of the, the difference between its zones from end to end. And so it's, this, this begins as a sort of uh, master plan, so to speak, for two kilometers of this stretch. But actually, the sort of from the east end to the central zone at the, at the fort and to the western zone west of Strawn, they have very different kind of atmospheres and contexts. And um, actually, those kind of lend themselves to a uh, very different pulse. And, and sort of one of the ideas is that uh, the programming could sort of build upon this, this kind of degree of pulse, where the West End could actually be a lot louder, it has no neighbors, you can kind of be more experimental. And then the Eastern section, in contrast, is much, much closer to the residential uh, units and it could have a different, different kind of vitality. So these are just a few of the early images of sort of how some of the Infrastructural actions are just about opening up the place to access, but allowing that to become um, places also of gathering. Um, some um, sort of uh, strategic connections that are made, and this one is so very emblematic for us of what the relationship between the old structure and any new additions could be. This is a pedestrian bridge that's actually suspended from the columns. I've had such a wonderful time working with um, Blackwell engineers and having these amazing discussions with the city engineers who operate this about like, yes, we would like to put a friction hanger plant here that uh, has suspension cables to a bridge deck that will draw completely from the excess capacity of these columns. And, and you know, um, these, are, these are hardcore transportation engineers, and so you can imagine from the first meeting of like, no way, not over my dead body, you know? And it's sort of also like, it's like, it's like you're trying to hurt their, their baby. And, and that's, you know, that, that's so, so that was amazing to sort of, um, you know, ongoing, we're talking like over a year uh, of, of really um, just get, making baby steps into the kind of conversations that, um, where, where I think everyone as a whole could start to imagine how actually these two can coexist and um, maintenance, 
uh, inspection operations and the sort of the, the operation of everything above can still be, can coexist with sort of, let's say, a new life below. But getting through those conversations actually opened up the possibility sort of to extend those into every other aspect of the project in terms of how we could set up rigging points and how we could start to actually equip this roof to perform in different ways for the things we imagine underneath. And incidentally, that bridge gives you sort of the best vantage points of the fort today, which is really buried behind uh, the ramparts that have been built, so you have these kind of overlooks. Um, and against all odds, and Michael, you're right about daylight, against all odds, the shadow studies under here at this particular section of the garden, gardener, like they, um, they surprise you. The amount of light, because the deck is so high at this point and you actually don't have the towers, uh, you know, we're getting that sort of afternoon sun. It's just unbelievable. And so we um, are, are really also trying to aggressively um, install a landscape that we think could be sustained in this environment. It's also sort of part of that, I think, sense of surprise of the, what, you know, things can grow under here. Um, but you're absolutely right about, like your point about uh, daylight and how that has to become central. Um, so, um, and, and then I, I you know, the, a big thing uh, about having a great roof is also what that could do seasonally. Um, and so skating, Michael, you, you, get, you showed this image. We're, we're still excited about um, the skating component uh, to be under this kind of civic roof and have a skating trail that in the first phase uh, would be the, the longest loop you know, in, in Toronto, um, about 400 meters. But in its full completion, we hope it could be a kilometer long and it would actually go towards the, the fort's uh, public library. So you could actually have a kind of gate at the uh, at, at a, uh, eastern part of the site. Um, so I, I think we feel like we're, we've learned a lot more about programming than we ever did about public space design on this project. Um, and like what we learned from the bridge, it's actually about now um, how we can start to think of this upper upper strata and actually allow to think of ourselves almost like stage designers or, um, in terms of equipping this roof so that we can things can happen that we can't quite yet imagine underneath. Um, so when you, uh, we hope you, you, you know, come check it out in about a year and um, and it will be ultimately the, like a, a real work in progress uh, that we hope changes over time. Um, jumping scales a little bit to a project that we were involved in in the early stages with the city in terms of um, conceptualizing the public realm for the Crosstown project. Um, we worked with Brooke McElroy and Planning Alliance at the time with a focus on thinking about actually uh, what it could mean to make a 10 kilometer cut through the center of our metropolitan area. Um, and even before we saw uh, this amazing kind of engineering feat of boring bo the boreholes and the kind of tunneling process, we knew that the kind of making of this line would like somehow connect to the geology, geomorphology uh, of the city and sort of to think of it as a cross section not only of communities the way actually a lot of the political leaders did because it cut through sort of every ward you can imagine, um, but also how it cuts through that typical cross-section of our city from valley to valley, um, you know, with the Don to, to, to the Humber, um, and, and, uh, and started to think about sort of the depth of that cross-section, that what it could mean to be traveling under, underneath, underground for a portion of it through the core, and then to be released out into the open. Because part of this line, of course, is, is, uh, is underground, much like a subway, and then it becomes an at-grade LRT. Um, so in those days, we were sort of fantasizing about a line that could kind of reject all the other sort of, all, I don't know, very globalized, um, I don't know, um, iconic kind of station design that's often just sort of plastered in public art, but actually could kind of get to its roots as really being a place where you feel you're underground. Um, we made these kind of presentations that were, at the time I was taking a subway from Pape Station uh, when it was under construction. Somehow it was the most beautiful it had ever looked, like all the tiles were off and the, con the concrete was all raw and you actually felt like you were underground. Um, uh, uh, and then I guess the counter to that is sort of the moment that you would then 
be released out into the valleys and how even today when you ride the subway there's those great moments when you go over the Don Valley or when you go to Old, Old Mill Station and just kind of thrown out into the um, into green from being in a kind of daze on the ground. Um, so, you know, some of the efforts really um, were about ensuring that actually the Val Don Valley at Leslie Street actually had a stop and a station. So some of, like there was a lot of discussion at that time about where was where were all the stops. So to ensure that that was um, made, and then another very simple but uh, like you know uh, part of the, the project was to uh, advocate for a green track on the at grade portion, so that this would actually be Toronto's first um, green track um, that would be less about the kind of Wimbledon lawn, but more about a kind of rougher valley drawn landscape that could be effectively sort of pulled out and pulled all the way to Scarborough. Um, so I, I think the, the thing we're most exciting to see is actually what this kind of looks like when they're, they're now being built. Um, and the last project I want to talk about, because I think it um, addresses the theme of the day most directly, is uh, TOCOR, which is, um, as Michael mentioned, a, a project that the city is, is undertaking under the leadership of uh, our chief planner. Um, and it's a series of building blocks around a number of subjects, and I can never name all of them. Mobility, energy, buildings, a number of other ones. And we're, uh, we're working on the open space, parks and open space, uh, parks and public realm component. We're working on that with Gell Studio, so the, the New York office of Jan Gell's office in Copenhagen. And of course, um, it's, uh, it's at that moment now where we kind of can revisit the city that we currently are living in and surrounded by, um, which was really a product of the Central Area Plan of 1976, um, which allowed for a mix of uses in the downtown, down, downtown core and produced this sort of incredible um, slow storm and then a kind of hurricane of, of growth, um, but actually has produced the kind of excitement and vitality of our downtown. But of course, in this quest, this quest for sort of rebalancing that, uh, that dense city uh, with its open space, we kind of dream about uh, having a, that kind of great central park in Toronto. And um, I think this project confronts the impossibility of that dream, that we'll never have a, you know, a 340 hectare park like Central Park in the in the core of downtown Toronto, we just will never do it. Um, and we, you know, we aren't lucky to have a kind of fragment of the old growth forest like in Vancouver or at Stanley Park. We just don't have that. But, um, but we, we, there are other ways to think about sort of the distribution and the kind of um, connect, connectivity of, of resources, of, of natural resources. And, you know, the grandfather of, our, of the discipline of landscape architecture, Frederick Law Olmsted, um, has a kind of amazing lesson for us in his um, emerald necklace plan for uh, Boston, um, where he uh, basically connected a kind of series of open space types from uh, common, common, common grounds, gardens, streetscapes, to ecological corridors um, and, uh, and wetlands and water infrastructure to, um, uh, in, you know, resources for uh, plants, botany, and then and recreational facilities, all in kind of one large interconnected <laughs> network. Should not be near microphones. Um, you know, what, what's inspiring about the Olmsted example that seems relevant to us today is that the way we experience a city and our landscapes locally on sort of on a district level or neighborhood level and then on a sort of city-wide level is somehow um, this kind of very itinerant and changing in a way where you know, there's the landscapes outside our street, but, but there's also the ravines and waterfronts of our city. And actually how we kind of participate between them is actually a really essential uh, component. And, and how that kind of defines our experience on a day-to-day -day basis with our landscape, but then also seasonally. Um, so, uh, for this sort of big daunting project, which is still in progress, I'm going to share sort of the, the kind of blueprint for how we've been looking at it, which is to think of it in three scales, from the scale of the city, because you only get a chance like this once every, I don't know, 40 years to actually think about the form of the city. Um, 
Secondly, sort of in, at, at the district real neighborhood scale. And then thirdly, really down to the ground into, um, into sort of the, the scale of almost like street corners. Um, and so um, here's again in the helicopter where you start to, again, remind yourself that the city is, uh, is unbelievably beautiful. And it is actually as much a landscape as it is a sort of skyline. And in some ways, the skyline becomes yeah, it almost becomes eclipsed at certain moments. Um, uh, you know, one reading of the city that for us uh, resonated is to think of it as two morphologies. One, the natural sort of landscape morphology of, the, of its topography, you know, largely sculpted by glacial retreat. And the other is the morphology of the urban grid and sort of this real, like, strong urban system that is laid upon it. Um, and it could be argued that, you know, sort of the way those mesh or interrelate um, is maybe the weakest, weakest point in our sort of city form and maybe the less considered up until this point. Um, and it starts to hint, especially, you know, as a sort of how the grid adapts to these irregularities. It's actually maybe a point of where we can sharpen um, the sort of the interplay between the, the urban system and the natural system. Um, and thinking about sort of through a lens of the source landscape of our city, original shorelines at front, front Street, the original stream corridors, um, the bluff of what was Lake Iroquois, which is still present at, um, at Davenport. We started to look at the city almost as an x-ray of uh, a kind of, of a system, like a kind of halo uh, that encompasses um, the sort of source, so the city's strongest original landscapes the Don River Valley, the sandbar that created the, the, the peninsula and the islands, uh, Garrison Creek, that Lost Creek Corridor that we talked about, um, the bluff of, of uh, Lake Iroquois, and how somehow if you amass what already exists, just disregard everything else for a moment, there's a figure that emerges of some of the most uh, diverse landscapes of our city, so like not only uh, parks, uh, parks that exist, but also some of our most um, ecologically sensitive areas, but also sort of our most dramatic uh, high points, uh, low points in the valley, and um, situations where you have the, almost the best vantage points back at the skyline, but on the other hand, the sort of best escape looking at nothing but a horizon on the, on the lake. Um, and, and so we uh, have sort of been, we've been proposing this idea that's not unlike uh, an Olmsted idea in Boston to think of actually uh, this network of, uh, of green that already exists and then start to uh, stitch it together through a series of actions that would be completed over time, but would be aiming towards a system that was fully connected and would actually be about 900 hectares. So that's more than double Stanley Park right there, and it was always there. Um, and um, you know that, that in our minds, that system could also start to sort of register that it is, it is, uh, it is our, it is part of our civic landscape, and um, and can be experienced whether you live inside it or outside of it. Um, so the, you know, and of course, this is a long-term thinking project. So this is not like we don't deliver this in two years, obviously. But this is for uh, this could chart a series of projects, parks department that transportation, urban design can all be working together towards. So they're, they're finally kind of aiming for something a little bit bigger, um, which is very typical by many cities. It's just um, we, don't always, we don't always do that. And so that, that sort of uh, antidote to, the, um, to that natural move, natural, the natural system would be um, thinking about the grid and particularly sort of a series of streets like the most representative of the city. We started to sort of highlight 10 or 12 of them, that kind of overlay then this uh, kind of matrix uh, of, of, of really important lines through the city um, that actually could be rethought less as conduits for cars and really more as public places. And some of them were already designed in that way, but just have sort of are a little bit more tired and maybe less, um, less fine-tuned to today's current city dynamic. And so one of them is, is university. Um, Jarvis and you know Jarvis had, was a street of amazing grandeur at one time. Um, today, not so much. Um, Bayview, a city that was just more like a, a road uh, designed by transportation engineers. But if you imagine as our first real valley street, it would be a completely different experience. 
Um, you know, all of these are sort of built around, I think, the, the, the wave of, of now, um, the next wave of design uh, for landscape architects, urban designers, architects, and thinking about streets um, as a sort of next territory of public spaces. Um, you know, we've seen the amazing transformation of Bloor Street, Queen's Key, there are hints in all of these things, um, but we can go a lot further. I mean, if you, come, uh, you bring a visitor to Toronto and you know, I think the streets are the, especially you bring someone from Europe to Toronto and they're just shocked by the streets. Um, King Street is a really important one um, that is um, becoming a priority uh, for re rethought um, and it's become a project now that um, the chief planner um, has highlighted. So there'll be a, we're working on a pilot to um, a pilot project with Gell Studio um, and uh, Sam Schwartz Engineers who were instrumental in the transformation of New York City streets to bring that kind of thinking to Toronto um, to think about King Street um, and actually test a co completely recalibrated street profile where streetcars could actually be efficient again on that corridor. So in a corridor where 65,000 people are commuting every day. Um, but also sort of rebalance um, for all other modes so I have to think kind of holistically about that street and mobility. So if you kind of look at just even the 10 streets and the, the right-of-ways, that's 120 hectares. And then imagine then the interface between, because each of those streets either connects to the valley or the Garrison Creek or the upper, upper ravine or the waterfront. But suddenly we have you know, a pretty immense uh, public space structure that could basically become a new anchor point for, for all development. I'll just move really quickly through the scale too because that's sort of where we can start to make connections between that larger uh, core circle and these what we're identifying as key kind of portal parks. And those could be sort of, um, those could connect into neighborhoods based around strong open space existing open space assets, but then start to actually give them a sense of gravity so that they, um, there's a kind of pleasure in moving from a park uh, to the city or from the city towards um, the ravines. And so there's ideas of lines of gravity that where open spaces can start to connect. Uh, one of those ideas is the stitch. And the stitch uh, would, would, is, is really building on an old idea. Um, Lieutenant Phil Potts sketch here uh, for the walks and gardens path along the, the, the former lakeshore. Um, and so that really is about like how Corktown Common can connect to West Onland, or Canary District, Distillery, Crombie Parks, Front Street, and then rail, Roundhouse Park into through uh, the Rail Deck Park and all the way over to um, Ontario Place and the ex exhibition. Um, so again, like, like, um, like the core circle, this has involved a series of projects that could you know, allow that to be opened up, to be more uh, legible and fluid. And then one of the showpieces would be yeah, the, the rare moment where you could create actually a significant park, but it's only 21 acres. So it, it's still actually very local in scale, um, but that's in one of the most uh, deprived neighborhoods of, of open space in the city. Um, and uh, you know, final idea that we've been really having interesting conversations about is how you could create um, a connection around the bay to build on Waterfront Toronto's sort of work on the front line and actually start to think about how our whole bay is able to be experienced as, a, as almost a, a massive water room um, to connect uh, downtown with Portland, the island, and the kind of western neighborhoods. It's, very exciting, very controversial, because how do you do that without, how do you open up access without sort of destroying the quality of, of, uh, of it being completely separate? And, um, but you know, that's a task. And then finally, scale three is really about kind of getting down into uh, the everyday corner of people's daily lives and seeing what change you can do fast to overcome this kind of uh, disconnect and quality. Um, this is a, a kind of x-ray of all kinds of other open spaces that aren't traditionally counted as parks, laneways, um, pops, which are publicly accessible private spaces, schoolyards, churchyards, cemeteries, um, and all, sort of all kinds of small, this kind of uh, confetti of, of spaces. If you add it up, it's significant, 150 hectares. 
Um, and there are sort of some kind of interesting emblems of the, that kind of space. Many of them are these parquets, which for a long time were just sort of really leftover space and hardly thought about. Um, here's an example, I think, for the next generation of open spaces at a very local level to be really renewed and renewed in a way that uh, could actually reinvent them. And th these are sort of, these are not considered spaces. Um, you know, there's other cities like Amsterdam um, went through uh, an exciting moment where they, Aldo Van Eck was, uh, of course, building playgrounds at a rapid rate. He built about 500 of them over 15 years. And these little insertions all over the city of playgrounds had a huge effect on the city. Um, it would be interesting to imagine what a kind of fleet of par parquets, great name, parquets, um, what they could mean um, let's say for the next uh, 30 years. So um, that's where I wanted to end, sort of that's a, that overview, and that's work in progress. Um, but um, really to start to see uh, and talk about this as a huge opportunity of fine tuning and to really think about our city as a work in progress that actually has its most incredible kind of bones and actually just needs to be sharpened. Thank you.